Take your Bibles and go to Exodus chapter number 34. And as you're going there, I want to ask you this. Have you ever been surprised or even hurt by how much someone you care about changes when they're around somebody else? Uh, the accent they use, uh, the swagger that they walk with, uh, just their whole demeanor seems to change. It, it's like you don't even know who they are. And our theme this year is with God. And simply that means when we are with Him, we have the glow of God. We have that radiance about us. But today we're talking about something that happens when we're with another influence. And we're talking about the jealousy of God. The jealousy of Jehovah. And how God gets jealous over us, his people, when we spend an inordinate amount of time and influence among another. Now, in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, we see how God is revealing himself. We looked at this last week, and you remember, we, it says that the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God is merciful, he's gracious, he is long-suffering, he's abundant in goodness and truth. Okay, so those five things we saw last week, and that's who God is. Then uh, verse 7 says that he keeps mercy. I, I love that. A, a keeper is, is like a guardian, somebody that's vigilant. They are, God is keeping mercy for you and for me. And, but not only does he keep mercy, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Keeping mercy, forgiving iniquity. And then the third word we saw visiting iniquity, which is sort of strange. Forgiving iniquity, visiting iniquity. And really the conclusion of the whole sermon last week was in order to move from that person that is visited because of your sin, you must repent in order to become somebody that is forgiven of their iniquity. Now, as we continue reading, we're going to start in verse number 10, and we're going to go down through verse number 17, we're going to see something very, very specific about God, God's jealousy. So we'll begin there in verse number 10. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant. Now, before I read on, I want you to understand this is the second giving of the Ten Commandments. Um, God gave the uh, Ten Commandments, and then in Exodus 32, uh, Aaron, which is Moses' older brother, uh, made a golden calf, an idol, and uh, tempted the whole nation to commit idolatry, that is, putting something above God. And so Moses, in his fury, throws down the Ten Commandments. He breaks the Ten Commandments. And now Exodus 34, God is giving them again. So verse 10, it says, I make a covenant. Uh, just glance down, just so that you know for sure this is what he's talking about. Look at verse number 28, 40 days, drink water. And, and at the end, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the what? The covenant, the Ten Commandments. So that's what the Ten Commandments are. They are the words of the covenant. They are basically the Ten Commandments parts of the ceremony, the wedding vows between a people and God. That's what the Ten Commandments are. They're not oppressive. They are to unify or to bring people close to God. Let's continue reading with verse number 10. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as not been done in all the earth nor in any nation and all the people among whom thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. And that terrible doesn't mean bad. It means amazing. This is going to be wow. Verse number 11. Observe thou that which I command thee this day, 
Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and the, the termite. The termite, okay. And verse number 12. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. And that is the verse that uh, George Washington got his famous quote from about making no entangling alliances with foreign nations. Verse number 13. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now verse number 14 is our text verse. We're going to be developing that. But this is God introducing himself to his people and says, this is my name because this is who I am. My name is Jealous because I'm a jealous God. Verse 15, lest thou make a covenant. What are you talking about? Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice and thou shalt and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons and their daughters go whoring after other gods and make thy sons go whoring after their gods and verse number 17 thou shalt make thee no molten gods and God is saying this to Moses the second time up on the mount he went up on the mount for 40 days got the first set of 10 commandments came down broke them because of the wickedness of the people's uh, false worship and he goes back up and he gets the second edition of the ten commandments the same thing and then god re-emphasizes here in verse number 17 thou shalt make no molten gods because that's exactly what they did and god is jealous father we come before you and we ask that you would open our minds and hearts help us to understand your will and your ways Many times we get things wrong. I pray that this would not happen. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this is the third sermon in our little mini-series about becoming a radiant Christian. And that word radiant, or the glow of God, comes from verse number 29, where it says that Moses' face shone when he talked with them. And verse number 30, And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. So there is an element, the glow of God, that actually is a fearful thing. That's important to understand, to get the right balance of the nature of God. Now that might seem kind of simple, but Michelangelo, the famous sculptor made several uh, images in Rome and they're on display today I've not been there but we'll show you a little image of Moses with horns and uh, this comes from a misunderstanding of who God is uh, the word here for shown or that radiance that glow is karen with a Q-U, Karin. And it means to radiate, to shine. It's luminescent, glows. But for some reason, they took another version of that word, and which would mean horns. And so here is the image of, of Moses with, with horns. I want to say that we can get the wrong perspective of God and we can give a false image so completely different that people make images out of stone and marble and they're there for thousands of years because they have a misconception about God. I submit to you that our day is filled with people that have a misconception of God. So we're talking about the jealousy of God. A definition of jealousy would be fiercely protective or vigilant of one's own rights and possessions. One's own rights 
and their possessions. Now, understand this. Most of the time, we think of jealous as somebody working out of fear and insecurity and weakness. But this is not true with God. God is rather working out of honor for his name and protection for his people. Say that with me. Honor for his name and protection of his people. Now, the passion of jealousy in man is usually exercised in a selfish and an evil manner. But jealousy is not necessarily sinful. A man may be zealously cautious of his honor and suspiciously vigilant over another without deserving any blame. We find Apostle Paul declaring to the Corinthian church, I am jealous over thee with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That is, Apostle Paul had an earnest, cautious, anxious concern for these people's holiness that the Lord Jesus might be honored in their lives. So let it be remembered then that jealousy, like anger, is not evil in itself or it could never be ascribed to God. His jealousy is ever pure and a holy flame. Now, God is a jealous God, and he is jealous over his deity. That is, God wants exclusive rights to worship. All of the history of humanity is about people giving away their worship to false idols, images, and behind those images, those works of wood and stone and gold, are demons and, and uh, treasonous traitors to the throne of God. All idolatry is an insult to God's deity. God is the creator. In Romans chapter 1, verse number 23, we can see this. This is, Romans chapter 1 speaks about how civilizations uh, not evolve, but devolve and go down. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. This is the essence of idolatry. It's exactly what happened in Exodus 32. Uh, they made a golden calf, made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. In verse number 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. That is, when you change the image of God, God steps away and says, oh, is that what you want? And that's a terrifying thing. When God gives you up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, friends, that is exactly what we see on display in the United States of America today. Verse number 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That is, God is jealous of his deity and any and all forms of idolatry is an insult to that. Now, we've talked about the second giving of the law there in Exodus 34. But remember, the first giving of the law is in Exodus chapter 20. That's right. Exodus chapter 20, in verse number 5, uh, it starts out, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Listen, it is not isolated that God presents himself as jealous. It's over and over again visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that, now that's an interesting phrase, hate me. And the context of this is if you serve another deity, it is an expression of your hate to God and God is jealous because he is your creator. These other deities, they're not exclusive. They work together. Um, if you read uh, in the Bible, you have all these uh, different gods, and 
Now, we studied uh, last year about the uh, 10 major gods of, of Egypt and how that the Exodus plagues were an attack and a destruction not on the people of Egypt, but on the false gods that had enslaved the Egyptians themselves and then the Egyptians had enslaved the Hebrew people. See, idolatry brings enslavement. It brings us low. It puts shackles, oftentimes golden shackles, of, of pleasure and pride onto a person. In Exodus 32 and verse number 5, we have Aaron, and Aaron's uh, Moses' his older brother, and, and he tries to kind of coordinate these two things together. They, they make the golden calf, but if you remember when we studied it in detail, Aaron said, ah, oh, we have this golden calf. I'm going to make an altar to the Lord and proclaim a special day to worship God in. Look at this in verse number five. And when Aaron saw it, that is the golden calf, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And that's the name Yahweh. It's Aaron's saying, we need to be worshiping God, but we can worship God through the golden stat statue. All of these ideas that we can create an image and we won't actually worship the image, it will help us worship God, is exactly what is forbidden by the first and second commandment. You are not to make an image of anything that represents God because you will bring God down. And pretty soon, you'll be making images of Moses with horns and what in the world? What are we doing here? And we need to guard our hearts and guard our worship that we give only attribute to God, to God alone as our creator, as deity and there's religions all around the world oftentimes in our nation it's not quite as bold but it's there and people will worship bread and people will worship this statue of jesus or the mother of jesus or the close followers of jesus and they will say this is simply helping me to worship god and I submit to you that that is the very context. That is specifically what God is forbidding. It's not close. It is exactly what God says. And we need to get serious about our following God because God is a jealous God. God's jealous of his deity, but not only of his deity, he's jealous of his sovereignty. Now, sovereignty and deity kind of sound the same. Deity is that God is God. Sovereignty means God is in charge. Oftentimes we use the word Lord as describing God's sovereignty. That is, he's the boss. He's the, he has the right to direct me. My rebellion, your rebellion against God in the times that we sin, when I lie, when I cheat, when I lust, when I am lazy and I don't do the things I should, should every single sin, every single one is an insult and is treason against the God of heaven. Our sin, it basically says to God, I will not keep your law. Now, occasionally you might stumble into, st into sin, but most times we step into it. It's calculated we weigh the risk, and we step in. Genesis 15 and verse number 16 is the passage where um, God promises to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I'm going to give you some land. It's the great covenant that God gives about the land of Israel. But God doesn't give it to Abraham right then. As a matter of fact, he says you're going to go into Egypt and you're going to stay for 400 years. It says, but in the fourth generation, and by the way, there are different values given to generations in the Bible. The shortest generation is about 20 years. They have 
40-year generations. This is a 100-year generation, the fourth generation. They, the people of Israel, shall come hither again. They're going to come back here. For the iniquity, this is interesting, don't miss this, of the Amorite, Amorites is not yet full. Now here's what you need to understand. God is merciful, he is gracious, and he is long-suffering, even with the Amorites. And God says to Abraham, you cannot have this land. It belongs to the Amorites. And their sin has not topped out yet. It's not full. And so you go over there, and in 400 years you'll be back. And that's when they're that's when God says, Moses, go in and drive them out. I submit to you that God is jealous. And the peoples of the earth don't... It seems like we have our property and we have our country and we have our land because of our own strength and of our own will and of our own devices. But God says, no, I raise one up and I put down another. And God moves people around. Why? Because God is jealous of his deity. God is jealous of his sovereignty. I think this land was given to our forefathers, not because of the color of their skin, not because God thought this group was... No, no, no. It's because of God. It's because of righteousness. I am telling you that... The history of the world can be summed up with the statement that God is at war with apostates. God is at war with nations that commit idolatry. That's a scary thing because we think of God as merciful, gracious, and long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, which he is. But God is jealous of his deity God is jealous of his sovereignty, our sin, our self-righteousness. That says, I'm going to pay my own way, my own merit, my own goodness, my own works are good enough for God and good enough for heaven. False doctrine, I believe what I want. I see it this way. My own opinions, I feel this way. And this this false doctrine and this prominence of people's emotions and opinions is not just corrupting the culture of our country. It's coming into our, our church where people think they can change their gender. People think they can change who God is. And this is not new. People have always been putting horns on Moses and altering things my friends we've got to get back to the bible we've got to get back to god we've got to get back not to what i think and you think and the most uh prominent voice will uh win no it's the word of god he wrote it in the book because god is jealous of his sovereignty all rebellion no matter how small it might seem to you and me is an insult to his sovereignty. He's jealous of his deity. He's jealous of his sovereignty. He's jealous of his glory. All idolatry is an insult to the glory of God. It is treason against heaven. The crowns that I might win, that you might win, that is because uh, we have learned this skill or we've gotten good at this. All of these crowns we must lay at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has blessed us. God has graced us. God has given us these things. Psalms 115 and verse number one says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. This week, I want you to give glory to the name of Jesus Christ. Not just say, well, praise the Lord with this. And that's a good statement to say. I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. But in your life, don't take any glory for anything. Philippians 3 and verse number 19 is a description of those that steal the glory of God. And the Bible says that their end is destruction. Why? Because their God is their belly. 
What can I consume? What can I use to appease my own desires? Whose glory is in their shame. And that's what's going on. As things try to switch, as we try to turn the, the Bible on its head as a society, and the things that should be embarrassing, this, the things that should be a shame to us are now being promoted and we embrace them with our pride. And the things that uh, are glorious, that we should give to God, we take for ourselves. And they mind earthly things. You know, it can even be done by taking half of Scripture, half the truth. Philippians 4 and verse 13 is a great verse. And it doesn't say, I can do all things. That is treasonous. That is an insult. It says, I can do all things, help me out, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It's through Christ. See, the glory goes back to him. Society is filled with the ruins of Greece and Rome and numerous other nations who take the honor and the glory and the privilege themselves. It's all God's. It all belongs to him. Nebuchadnezzar was guilty of this. God had promoted him. God didn't just put a crown upon his head. God put his head on his shoulders. God created him. But in chapter 4 and verse 30 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and the honor of my majesty? Now, he was a mighty man, but God made him mighty. I'm sure he was intelligent. He was probably a great speaker. He was probably all these wonderful things, but God was the one that did it. Verse 31 shows this. While the word was in the king's mouth, I mean, right then, as he's claiming all that glory and power and privilege, and I'm a self-made man, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. God said, I'll take it right away from you. All that we have, all that we are is God's, and God is jealous over his deity, over his sovereignty, and over his glory. In Acts 12, it records the story of another great man. It was Herod. I believe there was, um, I believe that there was 14 books written about uh, Herod and uh, Pontius Pilate in his day. I believe it was 55 outside of the Bible that was written about Jesus Christ. But anyways, Herod was a great man. And um, he claimed after this speech all the glory for himself. And this is an amazing thing. In verse number 23, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. I want you to understand that. Why did God smite him? Because he stole the glory of God. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now, this is, this is a, a hideous scene. I mean, if you wanted a, a gruesome scene to make a movie, this would be one right here. He doesn't die and is eaten of worms. He's eaten of worms, and then he dies. God is serious. God is serious about his glory. Psalm 29 says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Now this week, you will probably be successful in a few different things. Give all the glory and honor to God. And the better you do, give more glory. And when somebody comes up to you and says, Man, you are awesome. You are amazing. You just point that right back to God. That's the glory of God. And don't forget about old Herod. When he said, you know what, you're right, that was pretty good. And because, <laughs> I don't know what could happen, but I'm saying don't steal the glory of God. God's jealous over his glory. I think the moment we glorify ourselves, we become a rival of the Most High. Don't do it. 
One last thought here is God is jealous of his people. God is zealous of our humanity. See, all sin is a threat to the people of God. All sin is a threat to his protecting us. Now, I want you to go over to a um, passage in the Old Testament, and it is the book of Nahum. It is three chapters long, and um, don't let your neighbor not find it. If you, if you see him flipping back and forth more than four or five times, you're allowed to chuckle at him, okay? All right. So find Nahum there, and uh, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Yeah. So Jonah was sent to Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, and uh, uh, Nineveh repented, and so God spared them. But it was about 100 years later that they were in bad trouble again. They had not repented, and they had went back to idolatry. And so another prophet arises, Nahum, and in verse number 1, it says, of chapter 1, the book of Nineveh, uh, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. And it says here in verse number two, and I want, make a note of it in your Bible if you, if you want to. God is jealous. Now this is not an isolated thing. It's everywhere. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Now, Nineveh was a threat to um, Israel during Jonah's day. But Jonah reluctantly went and God brought incredible revival as the king and all the people repented. They went back to their uh, wicked ways and they had become another horrific threat to God's people. And God came in and wiped them out. Now, the history record history records that it wasn't until um, 1840, I think it's 1848 that Nineveh was rediscovered. Brother Tiger, you've been to Nineveh, right? I have not. not but you were right there close, right there close. Now, I don't know if the local people never knew it or never found it, but history says about the time of the San Francisco Gold Rush, 1849, 1848, Nineveh was rediscovered all those years. Centuries upon centuries and upon centuries, nobody even knew where it was because God is jealous of his people, and these people became a massive threat. You study the, the nations that became a threat to Israel. Oh, powerful, wealthy, intelligent. And this little country is just a little tiny place. But look at Egypt. And the servants of Pharaoh said, don't you even know, Pharaoh? Our country is destroyed. Look at Germany. Look at any nation that has threatened Israel. And God is jealous of his people. And I want to say... If you're a follower of God, God is jealous over you. God is jealous over you, and Nahum shows this. Verse number three. The Lord is slow to anger. Now this is, to me, this is huge. I, I, I'm just learning. I feel like every week God is teaching me so much, every single week. Verse two, it shows this fury and this wrath of God, and you're like, now what? The Lord is merciful, the Lord is gracious, the Lord is long-suffering. And Nahum says, that's exactly right. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Wait a minute, that's Exodus 34, 6 and 7. That's exactly right. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. In other words, God is sovereign and God will protect his people. And God does love you, and his jealousy is a token of his love for you. You know, if, um, if you got married and um, your spouse wasn't jealous of your time, wasn't jealous 
of your uh, affections, you would begin to doubt their love for you. You'd be like, I mean, you don't care that I'm talking to my old girlfriend? <laughs> you don't care that... Jealousy, fierce jealousy, is an indication of deep love. And God is saying, I'm jealous. I created you. I designed you. I love you. Verse number four. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Look at verse number 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Are you trusting in God? His jealousy is a token of his protection. God takes covenants very seriously. And that's why we should take every step of our life serious. And any form of idolatry, we can't just say, well, I'm worshiping God through this. And any entertainment with this or that, we can't just say, oh, God doesn't care about that. No, God is jealous. God loves me. And he wants my devotion to him. And God loves you, and he's jealous of your time and your affections whenever they go astray, especially to his rivals. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 24 says, The Lord God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. The jealousy of God is our subject today. And it goes right hand in hand with his mercy his graciousness, his long-suffering, his abundance in goodness and truth. Zephaniah 1 and verse number 18 says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire, say it with me, of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. You know what Zephaniah is being used of God to say? God's jealousy protects his people. You want to be the people of God. You don't want to be any of those that are polluting the waters of worship. Now, there has always been idolatry. And the Bible declares that broad is the way that leads to destruction. That is, there's a host of people that are worshiping at these false images. But the three Hebrew children wouldn't bow. They would not bow. And because they wouldn't bow and bend, they wouldn't burn. Because God protected them. God walked with them in the midst of the fire. And God will walk with you in the midst of the fire of your trials because he's jealous, because he loves you. Joel 2 and verse 18, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Remember, pity is similar to that mercy. He looks and he, he has pity and compassion. And therefore, he's going to be zealous for his possession, his land, his people. Isaiah 9 in verse number 7 speaks of the Messiah when he comes to rule and reign for a thousand years. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and uh, to establish it. And verse number 8. Uh, with judgment, there it is, uh, with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord is an indication of his jealousy. The zeal speaks of the energy, the, 
the promise of God that he is absolutely dependable. Listen, God is absolutely loyal. And God enters into these contracts with people. Now, the Ten Commandments was a wonderful, beautiful contract. And now the very Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come and he has established a new covenant, a new contract through the blood of the cross. And he is offering that to you. Now, it doesn't mean God's no longer jealous. Oh, he's jealous. His son, his son's blood paid for that covenant to be given to me, to you. And this week as you walk, this week as you work, this week as you shine, as you glow with the image of God, make sure it's the right image. And if you get a compliment, direct it to God. Direct, don't you dare allow that glory to sink in. Because as glory goes into your own heart, personal pride comes out. And personal pride is treasonous against the king of glory. Remember, last week's Sunday school, we studied Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas was there both those Sundays after the resurrection, as we studied. But he left that first Sunday before Jesus came. Maybe he was disappointed. Maybe he was angry, upset whatever he left everybody told him about it he's there in the assembly the next week and Jesus comes and Jesus comes and he says behold my hands my side he says put your finger in the holes of my hands put your hand right in my side and Thomas says one of the most amazing things I think he was on his knees. And he said, My Lord and my God. Lord is speaking of his sovereignty. God is speaking of his deity. In all of our doubts, in all of our questions, in every quest of life, my lips, your lips, our mouths must echo the frame, My Lord and my God. Whatever amount of talent, whatever amount of ability you have, whatever it is, it's given to you by God. It's wonderful. And it's to point people to God. All of life is pointing people to God. It's never me. It's always Him. Let's stand to our feet.